<laughs> G'day, Kurnothi. It is the coach here. I hope you are all collecting your leaves and recycling and um, composting and helping the garden of Sylvaneth and not Nurgle grow. Um, I am here with uh, an absolute champion, someone who I've wanted on the channel for a long time and sparked my little narrative journey as well. He, he kind of knows this a little bit. I, I love his army list when he talked to, to Facehammer. Uh, it is Matthew Davies or Davis that I've recently learned uh, the weird Wales kind of interaction. But indeed, we are talking Sylvaneth and we're talking third edition and how he's thinking about Sylvaneth given that he's just come off the tournament circuit going four and one um, at a very competitive Facehammer GT. And uh, I know there was some incentives and some changes to the to the um, the way that the event was run, but um, going four and one and going in the top 15, I think you were 12th, um, yeah. is a very good, very, very good considering that not a lot of people had Sylvaneth high on the meta. And, I, and we were talking just before we started, it's been actually a really long time, and I've the last time I played Sylvaneth, actually you guys have been had your FAQ again, and the the woods have changed. But without further ado, I'll introduce the guest, and I'll let uh, Matthew talk a little bit and, and introduce his story and and how he got into loving the trees and picking the apples and um, not running ro rolling wood dice because that's always weird to me why you'd do that. <laughs> so yeah, hi. Uh, so I'm Matthew. Um, I've been playing AOS for about two and a half years now um not so not that long uh i started playing sylvaneth because i love their aesthetic um and i literally weirdly uh, haven't played another army <laughs> um so it's been a rough ride as you can imagine um last edition uh, certainly um but this edition uh i've got so far i've done three tournaments or three two days and i came fifth at mankeen in carnage um, with a 4-1, which was a 70-man event. And I came 12th with a 4-1, um, this, this, um, obviously, at Facehammer. And I came 8th at a 36-man, uh, where I went I went top of 3-2 bracket with three wins. So I've been doing okay. So I'm going to have to be doing much better this time, <laughs> this edition. Okay. And for anyone who's worried about beating Sylvaneth, like Angus here, um, we'll see what we can get out of Angus to find out, uh, out of Matthew, um, how we're going to beat Sylvaneth because they are a fun army. They certainly play a little bit differently as well because they aren't used in the game very much. I, I've been playing against Sylvaneth since like day one. Um, in in my community, there was a lot of Sylvaneth players, you know, Chris Welfare, uh, Liam Burnett Blue. There was a lot of Sylvaneth players at the time. Um, in fact, I had like an episode. I, I remember doing the second iteration of the Sylvaneth book and I had four guests on, including like Laurie and I think Dan Shorts for, was, was running Sylvaneth. So it was like this mega cast. Yeah. And all, like, literally that second book saw the drop. Like a lot of people stopped playing Sylvaneth and it became harder. You couldn't dryad spam. The Wildwoods changed from the old base to the new bases. Like the Awakened Wildwoods had kind of changed. Um, there was a lot of changes in Sylvaneth and it stopped becoming popular in 2E. But, you know, you're what I'm hearing is you, you become successful. You're, you've, you've tapped in some goodness and maybe 3E is a bit more kind to Alariel's kin. Um, yeah, so uh, ironically, I remember watching that game, uh, watching that um, that show. So I watched that show when I, so when you did that, I just started playing Warhammer. Um, so it's not been that long uh, <laughs> um, because I never played. I played two games of the of the old book. Um, I only got, I got two games in and then the new book came out and every, everybody, I was watching loads of people. I was watching like, Laurie's tournament videos. I was watching yours. I was watching any, anyone who had Sylvaneth content. I was watching, and then it just kind of stopped uh, when mm. the new book came out, <laughs> and that was an interesting dynamic to go through. Um, but uh, I've I've loved playing them. Um, for, they they certainly I think battle tactics are the are the biggest thing. I think the fact that you don't have to uh, any any Sylvaneth are very like um, you don't want to fight. You want you want to play your own game, and any anything that in the game that allows you to not play the game more effectively makes Sylvaneth better or have the opportunity to be better. So battle tactics mean you never you don't need to get stuck in and kill things. So that means that Sylvaneth can do more effectively. 
Yeah, no, it's interesting. Like you never see this alpha strike type of I'm going to set up my silver death and just go absolute, you know, super Saiyan into my opponent and try to take them down in the first term. They're a super technical army. They're moving around the board. They're, you know, they're they're really taking you out with a scalpel and, you know, um, it, it's always been a really interesting army and, you know, you've had Durthu or Derpthu, uh, depending on which which side of the board you get. You get the ultra combat Durthu or the guy who can't hit, uh, for, you know, for, for anything really. Uh, I was going to swear, but maybe YouTube wouldn't like me swearing this early into the video. But, like, take me to third edition. So you, you've gone four and one in a bunch of tournaments and some really big tournaments, given that, you know, we are still in COVID and we can't go to maximum capacity in some of our venues. What are you finding in third edition that's starting to work for you that maybe second edition wasn't so kind to us with? Um, so I think I think there's a lot of there's a lot of small changes that in in like overall have helped improve the whole like state of the army effectively. Um, so so save stacking uh, as as controversial as it is um, means that Alariel is actually viable because she's very squishy um if you don't save stack because a lot will get through here very comfortably she has very reliable healing now uh which isn't which is a great change uh we got that in the, the broken um broken realms kragnos that that was really mm -hmm. good um but even then anything with mortal wound output anything with any anything like if we didn't have save stack and she'd be she she wouldn't really be worth her points because she wouldn't be able to survive long enough um so that that's one thing um so the, the big, like I said, the biggest thing is battle tactics, realistically. Uh, I've played three tournaments now, and I haven't dropped a single battle tactic in any So you've gone five out of five in yeah, every, every game. game. Um, the only one I dropped was in a game where I uh, got tabled by Zeke Jarpion, and there was absolutely nothing I could do about it. <laughs> um, but... Like, like I've played like the army. If you don't, even when you get, even when you lose, a lot of the time, you can do, you can keep a lot of the battle tactics, and you can go, okay, I've lost this game, but I know I can score all my battle tactics. So even in, uh, so especially in, so uh, one of the new types of um, tournament that have been coming out recently are things like uh, points differential tournaments, mm. where um, your result, your score result, is based on the difference between victory points between you and your opponent. So the worse you lose by, the more the um, the more po uh, points your opponent scores, and the less you score. Uh, but if but if you score closely, you get uh, less of a points differential. Um, and Silver and F have been fantastic for me in those kind of environments, um, for sure. And yeah, and you know, you, and, and just Hades really quickly. Dothu can take artifacts. He's not unique. Uh, it's the first thing that kind of blew my mind. I'm like. Wait a second. <laughs> Wait a second. Do, what? Because you would assume you hear the word Durthu and you're like, oh, Durthu is a unique character. Wrong. It's the spirit of Durthu. There's like eight of them in the lore or something. So, um, <laughs> yeah. mate, you can have multiple Durthus if you want to in your list. But um, yeah. it's interesting. Like, you kind of come back to original, you know, 3E. Um, it's, it's fascinating, right? Because um, when you start playing with the battle tactics, you, you quickly notice that tabling your opponent, like, you know, one, scoring all the objectives isn't nearly as important as it used to be. Second edition, you know, you had to spread yourself out to five, six, eight even objectives, and it was all about claiming more objective points and objectives over time. Yet now in most scenarios, it's one, two, and more. So holding eight objectives, if there were eight, is not as valuable as it used to be, but scoring your battle tactics is. And I've been watching and playing a bunch of games and my Discord has got like heaps of games going on at the same time. And you quickly notice if you don't have the, the battle tactic management, you run out of them really quickly at the end of the game where it's like, oh, they're just too hard to score. But hearing what you've just said, and I want to understand a bit more about battle tactics, you've got the tools in order to score them and the additionals with the monsters. You've got heaps of monsters and they're fairly priced uh yeah no a hundred percent so um you almost always in 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 third edition especially in any list for any army you always really want to have a monster um just because like monstrous takeover is like a free battle tactic essentially um so it, so when i play i always play with Alariel, and she gives me that uh but if you don't play with Alariel, obviously we have two ancients we've got dirthus we've got drancha we've got we've got loads of options um to, to be able to do that with um 
and then you have things like so a lot so everything kind of works like well so like alariel spear is is one shot twos and twos minus two six damage um if you play her in a certain sub faction called gnarl root she gets reroll once to hit and against a lot of armies they may have a unit of five a mod like so for example if for example if i was playing against a silver death matchup uh, they would have they might have five true revenants and then i can do broken ranks and then mm -hmm. realistically as long as i don't roll a one on the wound roll or a one into a one i'm killing that unit because it's minus two rent six flat damage um and then i've done the battle tactic with a monster yeah so and i've and i and so i've done my battle tactic and i have moved absolutely none of my army Right, so um, it just gives you lots of opportunity and things like true revenants. You can teleport them into your opponent's territory, um, and then you're like, "Cool, I've done, I've done um, savage spearhead to to units in your territory." If you want to be clever and you want to save it uh, for later on, you can do things like um, because the wildwoods allow you to teleport any unit. You could do something like you know, well, Ariel's going to commit to a unit that's in the back of the field. So you charge Larry Allen, uh, you turn, say, the Warsong Revenant, say that he's in your list. You use his spell to turn him into a wizard. Um, you get a Larry Allen to summon a woods on the other side of the board. Then you teleport him to the other side. And then suddenly you have two monsters in their territory. Or if you're playing a list that has two monsters in, you can do it without casting the spell. Um, and then suddenly you get the plus one point um, for doing the battle tactic. And that's, an, that's a point that your opponent has to catch up on. Um, and in a lot of battle plans, you only need a couple of points, like in the lead, to be able to take a game. Um, uh, and then you go through the other ones, things like running three units. Um, if you plan around it, you can literally, because things like Tree Revenant, so a lot of times in deployment, I'll put three mm. little units of Tree Revs just in the corner. And then they can't be shot because they're miles away from everyone. They're no, no threat. And then my first turn, I don't have any dependency on um uh, or like so if you just put three like battle line units because a lot of our units can teleport you can put three in the corner and then there's no dependency on them so my whole the rest of my army can do what they want and then those three units can just run in a little circle in the corner and then next turn i can still just teleport them wherever i want so they yeah. haven't lost anything they're not they're not they're not because a lot of the time when you run a unit you lose either you can't charge can't shoot or they that you have to deploy them in a weird way because they all have to be within three of each other um so it's all about kind of mitigating those just being able to do things so you, while your opponent's thinking about you know oh, okay what battle tactic am i going to do next turn you're like i've got my next three sorted so i can play the game not worry about it and you know and if all goes wrong i can just play for the battle tactics and try and pip at the end with points no, it's great. It's great that you've got so many options because there are other armies. And I think this is going to be, especially if you're going to a tournament, being able to achieve multiple battle tactics and not giving away and being able to then mitigate and reduce the amount that your opponent gives away. Um, there's a lot of cool tools. And I would agree that from what I've seen so far, and I'm certainly not a Sylvan Earth player, that you've got the ability to tap into those um those those battle tactics which is great and the chat's going off the charts you know they're so excited about sylvan f and you know lots of people are asking about alariel because um you know for anyone who hasn't been who might have joined recently um alariel got a new war scroll as you mentioned in broken realms kragnos you've got a new model and i'd love to hear your thoughts in a second about the war song revenant a brand new model um the wildwoods changed and one of the comments that um i can't remember i think like ben for example he was talking about was that the board size has changed as well so how has that impacted the wildwoods how how are you thinking about wildwoods and there's so much to unpack here so i'm not going to throw it at you right now but mm -hmm. we'll, we'll 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 unpack them kind of as we go so let's start with some of the 3e stuff right so the way that you're looking at your list composition how has it changed compared to 2e um were you running battalions um are you running battalions now um you know, Alario, you didn't used to see a lot in the table. You might see the Tree Lord Ancient. You might see Durthu. Occasionally, you saw Drycha. Um, you often used to see, like, branch witches and branch wraiths on the table. How are you thinking about this composition currently in 3rd edition? Um, so I think I, I think it's massively changed because in, in, um, in 2, obviously, the aim was, realistically 
to either take to be able to kill your opponent's big things. That was kind of how you had to play. Was you had to have a hammer in your army that you could reliably um, kill something with and get them in. So my list in two looked like well, I was playing Dreadwood, so I had a teleport. I had six swords. Uh, a lot of people around six sides. You know, hive, teleport, charge in, kill something big. If you can't do that, you lose the game. That was a lot of what two was. Um, and there was a lot of trying to build up combos to try and get that one unit to kill something. That was a lot of what two was. Um, and your list kind of, you kind of went, okay, how can I, what what in my list can do that? So you'd go Durthu, um, <clears throat> Alariel not so much into. So you'd go Durthu um, or Colonel Hunters and you'd go, okay, how can I buff those up as much as I can so they offer an offensive threat? And you still do that in three. Um, it's just in the list building phase, I think you think a lot more around, okay, what's my grand strategy? You know, how realistic is it that I'm going to keep a wizard? So I do prize sorcery because I think um, it's the best one for the cut list that I run. But if you run things like if you're running multiple Durthus, if you're running like a Tree of Lynch and multiple Durthus, you might do um, uh, Beastmaster. That's the one to have a, a, a monster at the end um and things like that so you kind of want to make sure that you've got a um you you kind of need to know what kind of list you're building you know are you building a monster mash list are you building a you know stay back and try and shoot list are, are you building a get stuck in list are you building a board control list and once you have that you kind of build around a grand strategy and then you have a think about okay what what so the way i do it is i look at what's top of the meta in the uk and it is some horrible things. Uh, <laughs> and then I go, okay, if I play against that, how can I, <clears throat> what tools do I have against that to be able to to beat that army? Um, so what are, and, what are some of the armies that you're thinking about right now? So, uh, when, and, and obviously, obviously worldwide, you know, I've got an audience in America and Australia. So yeah. take this with a grain of salt. It could, me, could mean that it's coming. It could mean that we're going to avoid it. But um, what are some of the things that you're seeing and you're building around? Yeah. So a lot of what um, the army struggles against is anything that can. So I, so if you go into the magic side, especially of Sylvaneth, which Sylvaneth kind of does okay. It doesn't do exceptionally well in two because there's not a, there, there's a lot of buffs to cast on one person, which is the one, and then you kind of get no buffs on anyone else. Um, but there's a there's a, a huge amount of things like so Teclis um, and Archeon and uh, Megas, exactly. Megas running Mega uh, Mega Gargans, Hulkamania yeah. running wild on the tables. It, <laughs> I see Gargans everywhere. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all the time um so what about, so Gargan, track? what about what about a little ginger ninja um i don't see as much go track um okay. so go track is a really awkward one to play against um but for, fortunate for me so go is a bit of a weird example for me because i played well so my one of my, my best mates played go track all of last edition um and he did very well with him but i played him like twice a week um so i'm so used to playing against go track and i don't think a lot of people are and whenever i play him because of the way my list is designed i kind of give him a 16 inch bubble of you can that's your zone not mine <laughs> um but so, like that, so you're not engaging because yeah you're not engaging because i guess you're right. Like if you if you play Got Trek, it takes you a few times to actually understand how to handle it, and then you quickly learn that to take him down is a very tough challenge, and you need an industrial amount of mortal wounds, or you might just find that getting away and kind of just allowing him the space to do whatever he wants, but not engage, redeploy, uh, teleport around, and just kind of avoid the combat um, is often the best strategy to handle this four hundred point hero. Yeah. Well, I said you're not, it's a hero, not a leader. But yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think I think a lot of the time with GoTrek, it's more about offering your opponent opportunities to make mistakes with him, rather than if you don't have the tools to deal with it. If you have the tools to do, if you have thirty iron tricks, just shoot him off. But um, 
but if you don't have the tools to deal with him, if you, so sometimes I might like deploy my army at the back and then Gochek could walk onto an objective or he could run forward past the objective to try and get into my army. And that would be a mistake because then I can put five true revenants in behind and on the objective and then I don't have to deal with him. And then maybe next mm. turn he kills those true revenants, but that's a turn that I've gained points where I, sh where I probably shouldn't have done. But then also you could argue that, okay, but Gochek's just sat on an objective. He's not killing anything, so he's not getting any points. So it, it gives the opportunity for my opponent to, to, to make mistakes, which then I can capitalize on and I can play around. No, that's okay, fair. That's fair. No, it's good. It's good. It's a good lesson because, like, you you know, you, you'll play against a god track once or twice and you won't quite know how to handle it. And then you get a little bit of insight and try a few things. But from what I'm hearing from a Sylvaneth point of view is it's really utilising your movement and your ability to jump around the board, uh, whether it is through the wild woods, whether it's through things like the tree revs, who I think are great value still, yeah. um, tree revs. And we'll, and we'll go through one of Matthew's lists um, towards the, I guess, the middle or the end of the show. But I, I, what I, I'm, I'm still trying to understand right now is is what's the silver death mindset of you know things like coherency i was thinking about this and uh, you know i i was for a short period of time a silver death player i built a silver death list uh if you look at some of my old shows i actually built a whole silver death list the day i picked up the book the silver death book was the day that games workshop announced cities of sigma so oh. i didn't even unwrap the plastic of my battle tone because i'm like come on man i'm an old yeah. <laughs> i'm an old warhammer player and like my, my my passion went like that. But I still love the idea of running 12, 15 Kurnoth Hunters. I was converting Orion out of I mean, Magnus the Red to make a you know a, a custom uh Durthu. But with with Sylvaneth, I guess one of the things that I was thinking about was coherency and yeah, coherency. Uh, especially because a lot of my experience is against Kurnoth Hunters, whether it be a unit of nine, a nine sides, units of six swords. Um, mm -hmm. Bows were always in like units of three. You never really saw, I never really saw block big blocks of six or nine bows. It was always a block of nine sides and then either threes or sixes in, in, in swords or sides. Mm -hmm. But with coherency coming in and going over five, how has that changed the Kurnoth build? Yeah. So uh, it's two things. So um, the one thing that changed uh, was obviously, um, obviously you can't take nine sides anymore because they're not battle line. So you can't reinforce them twice. Um, I used to take six swords, um, but the problem with swords is they only have a one inch range and they're on big bases. Uh, so you can never get more than, uh, if you do it properly, you can get like four in. But realistically, if you're committing six kernels across the board, you want to be getting all of them in. Um, and then the other change is the fact that boards got smaller. Mm. So the build you used to do was, um, you play Dreadwood, which gave you a command point teleport. And then you have Spite Swarm Hive, which is an endless spell that gives you plus three to, to move and charge rolls. So what you used to do was you used to put that next to your nine sides or your six swords or six sides, teleport them across the board. So then you have a six inch charge instead of a nine inch charge them into something, kill something, and then go, there's uh, 35 or uh, 50, uh, 60 wounds to deal with. Have fun. Can you kill them? Because they used to reroll mm. saves uh, when when they were charged. Uh, well, when they did put down their, When they put down their roots. Exactly, which has which now changed to plus one save. Um, so like that, that was kind of the play style. But with smaller boards, it's a lot easier to screen out now. Um, and also the fact that coherency kind of hits you hard. You don't really want to do that anymore because there's no, there's also no incentive because sometimes on on old like um, like focal points or border war or something like that, there was it was four points for your opponent's objective, so you might mm. commit early, take those points, and then try and hold off for the rest of the game. Whereas now you can, I could, I could um, teleport six so, uh, or nine sides, uh, six sides, sorry, forward, charge them in, kill something, but then they've got two, three turns to kill that stuff, and they don't really lose anything for not worrying about the rest of my army, because as long as they're doing like, oh, I'll run three units at the back, right, go in, kill that. Um, oh, I've, you know, I'll put two units in your territory, right, we've killed them all, that's, um, that's 450 points of your army gone, and, like, you've gained nothing, effectively, points, like, mm. in actual game points. 
Um, you're not getting we might have to move that mic for a second matt you, you you're super excited oh. and kind of not not that's all right you keep knocking at it you're so animated and excited <laughs> but but you you, you know you, you it's, you're right because um when you had these high incentives that you know um an objective was worth multiple points or even the combinations where if you had like this one and this one it was worth more you know you had an incentive to put down a big block of nine but now with the one, two and more and even uh, being able to remove a, a non-primary objective in turn three, um, you know, you've committed your 500 points of force that disappears. You haven't got a wild wood around, like what's the value and like what's going on here? Um, so it's an, it's an interesting one. But you, uh, for a second, I, I, I completely forgot that Kurnoth Hunters weren't battle line because I was running so many Kurnoths. I'm like, surely, but no, I was running three units of three spite revs in outcast for like the cheapest yeah. battalion and battle line known to man um but anyway like f forget about my build does that mean that with with your kernoth hunters um do you find that having a block of six swords isn't as valuable because you're not going to be able to string them out and get as many into combat or have you found it's no difference um yeah so exactly that so i find six swords unusable now realistically because you lose, you can't get more than four in combat, like realistically, uh, without losing one to coherency. And you can play that you, if you lose one, you can be fine, but playing to lose models isn't really a good strategy. Um, so it's just kind of, you need, when you commit those things, you need them to know that they're going to kill things. And especially with, um, they only have one inch range and they only have one rend. So and that's the killer. It does the mortal the, wounds. The yeah. swords are the swords are great for mortal wounds, but it's the range of one. And I've always felt that swords were better in units of three and keep yeah. the sides to that big block of six, formerly nine, um, because of as Ben's pointed out, the two inch reach. Do you think that yeah. means that having a block of of six is still good with the sides? So the the, the problem I have with sides is that six sides are good. Like they're fine. They'll do. They 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 also have two rend, um, but they are D three damage. Um, but the the issue I have with them is that um, Silver Neth are generally an unreliable book. Um, every everything's very swingy, and the 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 aim is always to make things as reliable as possible. Because if you're playing, because um, you know people say, oh, there's a there's a twenty five percent chance of this happening. You're like, okay, but if you're playing five games at a tournament, that means odds wise, it will happen at least once. Um, so you always kind of want to play around it. And the, the question I ask myself whenever I'm building something so if I threw is that if I wanted to use a unit, if I rely on it for a battle tactic, do I would I do it if that makes sense? So if I knew six sides perfectly, we're going to get into say, um like a Keeper of Secrets or something on a four-up save, right? So like Kairos, yeah. would I choose the Bring It Down battle tactic? That's my question. Uh, is that it, I ask myself, okay, if, if I have, if, if in a perfect world, everything goes off, would I choose that battle tactic? And the answer is, is probably not because there's a good chance that they, they kill him, but there's also a pretty good chance that they don't kill him. <laughs> so it's the, if I'm committing 450 points of my hitting army to something, I want it. I want to know that that's the battle tactic I'm going to be doing, personally. Um, so I wouldn't use them, just because I don't like relying on a big hammer unit that just does that one thing, that um, that won't ever offer me something more. If that makes sense. No, no, it makes sense. It means that you're looking for a bit more flexibility in the force as opposed to one thing that it does really well, but it's also inconsistent, especially you're right. Like I've seen, I've seen people lose battle tactics with a simple redeploy that's just gone out of their favor, right? You know, you roll a, a good save and that's probably where like the corn demon prince, for example, is causing nightmares in the meta is because that, that makes you halve your move and your run and your charge. And then if I do a redeploy and it's like three or four or higher, it means it's impossible and you have based your battle tactic around killing this unit, you know, whatever that might be. Um, so you're looking really for consistency. And I guess, um, yeah, interesting. Yeah.
I, I can't move on without asking about bows then because yeah uh, and, and because some people in the chat it seemed like they're liking the ideas of bows you know and, and again I'll go back to Ben Ben mentioned you know in two, second edition you didn't see a lot of bows um, they didn't do a lot of damage they didn't have, you know they weren't a worthy target to kind of put your buffs on again you had swords and spears for example so swords and, and sides which were a better unit to get the bows. But are you are you liking the bows? And if so, why is it good, a good time to get bows? Yeah. So I quite like bows. Uh, it's quite. It, I, st I still have to argue with a lot of people that I like bows. Um, so I think I've definitely proved now that bows are okay. But uh, but people still are not too uh, keen on the bows. Um, but it's more because their damage output isn't that good realistically. Um, so they're two shots each. I I, I use a unit of six. Um, in in two, you would only ever use units of three. And the reason for that is because one model in a unit can be a hunt master and they get plus one a hit. So you'd be doing, so you'd have six shots, two of them would be hitting on threes, the others would be hitting on fours. Um, but in three, obviously all out attack is a thing. Um, so so I run them in null root, so they get to reroll ones. So it's 12 shots, threes to hit, rerolling ones, threes to wound, uh, minus one D3 damage. Um, and it's not, it's, and it's not the, the damage output is okay. Like it does fine damage, um, into you, you want to be aiming for the lower save stuff. Um, however, it's in combination with, a, there's a lot of chip damage in the army. There's a lot of range chip damage. They have a 30 inch range. So you need to get nowhere near anyone. Uh, and you have global threat because obviously you can teleport through your woods and shoot. Mm hmm um and you can hide from things like bow snakes because you can put them in the woods and then they can't shoot you but you can shoot them um so there's a lot of play with them and they're they're five wounds each on a four up save um their ability to uh, tangle uh, tangle thickets means that um when they basically if they get charged they get plus one save um for a one inch pylon which you're not really that bothered about um and they get you know, if you're doing that and um, all out defense, and then maybe you mystic shield them or put them in your tree so they got cover. You know, there's potential plus plus four save there. Um, <laughs> so they're on a three up, ignoring you know two rend. Um, so they're having so there's a lot of and then suddenly that's thirty five wounds on a three up save, ignoring two rend. Uh, and there's a spell that you can bring them back. An Ariel can heal them. There's a spell that can heal them. They count as twelve on an objective because they're two wounds each. Because they're five wounds, sorry, so they count as two each. Um, mm -hmm. So things have you have to get through them at some point. Uh, and my favorite thing, it's actually a bit of a, a bit of a double edged sword. The fact that they're not battle line. So because they're not battle line, you nobody wants to commit to them because they don't get anything for killing them. There's no real, you know, you broken rank. Them. Broken ranks means nothing to this one. Exactly right. So so if you're spending a turn having to kill my Kurnoths, then. You know, maybe that means you're not doing a battle tactic that you should be doing. Or maybe that means that they're not doing, maybe their monster's going in there to do it. So their monster's not doing Kill My General or their monster's not doing Savage Spearhead or anything like that. So so that's why I think. So I really like bows because all, all our attack means that they go from fours to threes, which drastically increases um, their output. Yeah, no, I like it because I was looking at the rend and it's only rend one, right? Like I'm looking at this going, it's rend one. There's a lot of high armor right now, whether it's two ups or three ups. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, as you said, safe stacking. But what you're targeting with the Kurnoth Hunters is the support heroes, the the low wound, you know, sentinels, bow snakes, things that are hard to kill. Maybe it'd be interesting to see how you handle the um, the Auric, uh, the, the cruel boys with their their big guns because they're going to shoot off people as well. So yeah, they'll really bring a different good. set of pain, but they're only like in big yellows uh, up to 27 inches if they don't move mm -hmm. while well, you've got 30. So it means you can actually trade blow for blow. And if you're lower drops, um, uh, really good chance for you to be able to handle some of these shooters in the, in the meta. No, a hundred percent. And obviously we had the one thing we do have in, in Silver Neth is the fact that our Wildwoods block line in sight. Um, mm. So if you can set up decently, uh, so they no longer block Silver Neth line of sight. So you can put your six bows in the woods at the front and you can see them, but they can't see you. Um, so it gives doesn't you help with the sentinels though. It doesn't help with sentinels, but for most other units, 
um, the blocking the line of sight is going to be great for you. I think that's that was a really nice change because initially it was like it blocks everything, yeah. and then it was like it blocks nothing, and it it, 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 it does impact you though. Like anything that's at, um, that's ten wounds or more, like your um, your dry chur and your tree rev, not your tree revs, your uh, tree lord ancient and things like that can't hide in the wild woods anymore because yeah. they're above ten wounds. Yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, I mean, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's ups and downs to the wild woods. They've, they've changed so much, um, but that's why that's why I kind of only have that's why I love War Song Revenant so much because you can put him in in the tree, uh, which gives him plus one to cast, and then he can just sit there for the whole game um, <laughs> um, and stack uh, Throw the Vine, which is another combo you do um, pretty pretty commonly. Um, you used somewhere. to see that with the the branch wraith was it the branch yes. wraith or the branch which used to like throw in a vines and it didn't move it got like plus a million yeah. uh so like the bellwind yeah. vortex yeah so so the way the way it works with branch wraith is uh well with anything is so there's a spell in the sylvaneth uh law uh called a throne of vines and what it does is it gives plus two to casting rules for the caster until the caster moves so if you um so if you cast it on turn one, you're on plus two to cast. If you cast it on turn two, you're on plus four to cast, and so forth and so forth. So you can get on a ridiculous number to cast, effectively. Um, and in two, it was that's what you did. You did it with a branch wraith. So then you could. So the spite storm hive combo that I was talking about earlier, spite storm hive is cast on a seven, uh, so it's quite reliable. But if you've got plus two, it's a five, which is much more reasonable. So so and then you do that, and then the branch wraith has a spell to summon dryads. Um, so what you do is then then you try and churn out Dryad with her. Um, however, mm -hmm. in this edition, since we've got the new guy, the new um, the new the Warsong. Uh, Warsong Revenant, um, his spell is called Unleash Swarm of Spites. And for every unit within nine inches, you whatever the casting roll is, you roll that many dice, and every five up is a mortal wound. So as you can imagine, that he's a two cast wizard. He's not unique, so you can give him artifacts. Uh, and that com combined with the fact that he can cast Throne of Vines and start stacking spells, and Spell Portal exists, suddenly you have a 27-inch threat. You know, potentially, if you're on turn four, you can be on plus eight to cast, and he has a plus in eight or plus one. Mm. So, on, and in uh, if you play Gnarl Root, uh, there's an artifact that can um, make him cast on 3d6 and remove the lowest. So on average, on 3d6, that's a 9. You get plus 1 from his innate, so he's casting on a 10. And then if he's on plus 8 to cast, that's 18 dice for every unit within 20... Well, within a little 9-inch bubble within 18. Um, and every 5 up, there's a mortal wound for every unit. Um, so there's a lot of mortal wounds. Uh, there's a lot of potential there. Um, and and four up ward save, yes, and and he's got four seven up ward up save, ward. yeah. Like so, it means obviously you can hide it in a wild. You, you can hide it in the wild woods because it's under ten. It's a sub commander, so it can go into battalions easily. Four up ward save. I had this theory that I love the idea of having a double war song, and I could see myself writing at least having a double war song. Where one being defensive or utility, one maybe going more of an offensive build and kind of supporting whatever you know, Drycher, you know, Durthu, Kurnoth hunters, whatever's going out there to, as my hammer. Um, I, I really like the war song, and it's fairly priced. Yeah, for sure. Uh, no, he's, he's super well priced um but i could see that i mean i i just it, it's nice uh sometimes being on like turn four going oh you know there's nothing really to hit with a mortal wound output oh well i'll just summon some trees oh i'm on plus eight to cast oh it goes off uh, <laughs> um and the the biggest thing as well is that um because i cast on 3d6 um miscasting has a very low chance of going off um mm because you have to roll three ones as opposed to two. Um, so, yeah, so that's a pretty big deal. Uh, and the other, there's, there's quite a lot of options in the Sylvaneth book for artifacts. Um, so some people like to run a Warlord battalion so that they get the extra artifact and mm -hmm. then uh, give him this one that when you cast a spell from the law, you auto-cast it a turn. 
So you can auto cast Throne of Vines and then try and cast his spell. So he's, he's guaranteed getting the bonuses to cast. So it becomes much harder to unbind if you're playing against magic heavy lists. Um, as they, there's a lot to do with him. He's, he's a really cool, he's a really interesting model. Um, yeah. He is, he is quite hard to, to play with, though, um, from what I've seen. Because a lot of people say, so I love him. I love playing with him. Um, and I love not moving him. So I deploy him and then he'll never move ever again. Uh, he'll go in a woods and he'll just stay there. Uh, because obviously Throne of Vines, uh, the buffs leave if you move. So we just leave him, and then he'll do his little bomb, and then just stay there. And it's really weird to play like that with a 275-point model. Uh, it kind of People don't really... People are like, why are you not moving? And I'm like, well, I'm playing for turn 4 or 5. I don't really need to do anything until then. Um, so people kind of get caught out with that. But it's really cool. I, I love him. Uh, but I've seen a lot of people... I play, I, so when I was playing at Fierce Hammer, um, I, there was three other Sylvaneth players, I think. might have been four. And when I came over to check on their games, they were like, oh, yeah, Warsong's dead. And I was like, well, how is he dead? And they're like, oh, because I moved I put him at the front and I moved him forward to get a threat range first turn. And then they alphaed me. And I'm like, okay, you, no. <laughs> I'm like, I completely understand why you'd want to do that. But it's, it's not, not a vampire lord on zombie dragon. It is yeah. not a 14 <laughs> wound, like healing every five seconds. Exactly. You won't do that. No, that won't happen. Uh, it is, it, it's good and it's and it's super durable, but it's not invincible. And enough damage will we'll still take that out because it is only seven wounds. Yeah, it's seven wounds on a five up save as well. So you're never getting better than a four up. Um, so it is, it is, I, get, it is killable. So. And you don't want to be spending your heroic action to be healing that or, you know, using your other heals. Like, you you know, there's other units in the army that you want to spend your heals on. Exactly. Uh, but speak, speaking of healing and, you know, like it's interesting because, you know, uh, people are saying, you know, it's a bit it's a bit expensive and you're right. If I was looking at a, a, a non-Alario build and that's where I want to go next, yeah, yeah I, would, I could see myself running a double war song. Yeah. But when I'm doing like big, big, thick mama, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have the point. I don't have the points to do double no. war song yeah. plus plus a Lariel plus everything else. Yeah. Um, it's still it's still great in, in my opinion. I can definitely see good use, especially with battalions being so hard to put in commanders. Um, and you've got so many good commander options. Any way you yeah. can get a sub commander. And I noticed that in the list that you were going to talk about, there is no branch wraith or branch witch. Um, so has the value changed in those models at all in your in three E for you? Um, so uh, basically, that the, the the reason I don't put him in her in or oh, either of them in is more down to experience um, of how my games have gone. So when I've played against sort of destruction armies or gargants or anything like that in the mid tiers, I don't find that they're ever needed. The, the like because they summon dryads, right? That's that's their value. That's what they add. Um, so I need so I need a wizard to try and summon cogs, which uh, I'll explain later makes war song better. Um, but the branch wraith's appeal is to having the fact that she can summon dryads. Yes. But in the games that I was playing on the mid tables, I was already winning the games by turn four. So the dryads never really came into play ever. Um, and the armies that I struggled against, I was never getting, were, were magic heavy armies. And those armies were stopping me getting the spell off anyway. Um, so 10 dryads never really like made an effect at all uh, in my games. Um, and I kind of wanted to to try something different, um, that like because I had some spare points, so I wanted to try something separate. And what I ended up with was a knight encounter, um, who offers me a really good once per game auto unbind into um, anything um, my opponent might go. So a lot a lot of armies have crutch spells, right? So if I'm playing against Obiar Nagash, they need to get that protection of Nagash off, so they can teleport Nagash and move him. If I can go, you want to stop. You want to, you want to stop Breach coming summoned up for some exactly. of those Alpha Strike. Yeah, there's, there's, there's yeah, absolutely. There's yeah. a whole bunch of clutch yeah. spells. Being able to, I used to run the Night Encantor a lot, and just knowing the ability to go right, no, at least I'm exactly. denying you a turn, and then I can use my abilities to try to handle you while I delay that clutch spell not going off. 
Yeah. So in in game four, in so I ran that in face hammer. I ran a similar list. It's slightly different now, but it, it was similar in face hammer. And in game five, I played against um, a great opponent called um, P- uh, Piotr, and he was running twenty five bow snakes. Uh, yeah, which is a lot of bow snakes. Um, That's a lot of bow snakes. Uh, but in turn, uh, in turn three, he got uh, Mind Razor off on an eleven, uh, which is very scary, on uh, Marathi. And I, um, auto- I was like having that auto unbind went no, nope, you're having that, no thank you, <laughs> and that meant that Alariel survived the combat with Marathi, and then healed back to full because she heals two d six a turn, and then I was able to kill Marathi on my turn. So it just whereas if I'd have had a branch wraith. 10 dryads wouldn't have done a lot in that matchup. Um, so that, that's kind of why. Because I, I kind of, I sh- my list should dominate against um, any kind of destruction or like um, any just uh, non magic armies. Do you think the value changes though if you didn't have Alariel? And we are going to talk Alariel in a second. I want to talk because because she did get a new war scroll. And I was relatively impressed when I was doing the preview for Kragnos. Um, I was generally impressed with some of the, the the new rules within Alariel, and I've noticed that she's being used not just in Living Cities, but also back in Sylvaneth list. And it feels like I didn't see Alariel in Sylvaneth since first edition. I think that was when I saw her last, um, at least on the competitive scene. So do you think the value changes of those little summonable heroes um, getting the Dryads out if you didn't have Alariel? Uh, yes, no, a hundred percent. I think if you don't take Alariel, then you need um, as m- the reason I like Alariel is because she hits hard. She, she's something you can throw forward, and you can you can hit a unit without committing anything. Um, if you don't have that, then I think it's important to have something that does offer you some kind of um, backup. So then, if you've got like a Durthu, if you've got a um, a True Ancient, having Dryad suddenly is really good because then you can stack saves on them really reliably and you can have them on a four up save ignoring ren two without any effort at all um and that's and minus one to hit if then it woods you can set up you go you can go board control like i was talking earlier about the list kind of style you can go board control you can make sure you get you go true ancient you get a couple of wizards in so first turn you've got three woods on the board um, you know, you've got Dryads on one objective, Dryads on the other objective, um, True Lynch in the middle, giving them all a plus one save with his command ability. Um, and then you and then you, you have much more options and much more, well, well, at least at least triple the amount of models I have in my army. Uh, <laughs> so and and I, I always love I always love her flex by being able to bring on either the 20 Dryads, the 10 Tree Revs, the three Kurnoth Hunters, the Tree Lord or the Branch Witch. At least you've got some flex where, depending on the matchup yeah. and, um, you know, you do pay for her. Like her summoning is built into the War Scroll. But for me, when Life Bloom got added that she heals 2d6 in addition to healing, you know, units around her up to d3, like that was a game changer for me because all of a sudden she became really valuable as a uh, a combat monster who can then go in do some good damage you know the great antlers uh, does great damage you got, you got the the, uh, the the spear of kurnoth as well does yeah. some solid damage and then she's healing 2d, 2d6 back in your hero phase so it means either my heroic action either could go into her and just get her up to full if you get a bad roll yeah. or I can go for the extra CP or the finest hour and still be healing. Yeah. And there's a lot, there's a lot of like little tech there as well, because so Elariel's heal happens at the start of the hero phase, uh, as does everything else. So te- unless uh, you're playing at a tournament that comps it specifically, you can do, you can, before doing your battle tactic, you can heal Elariel. So you can say, okay, I'm going to roll Alariel's heal. Okay, she's not healed anywhere near full. Okay, I won't rely on her to do my battle tactics then. Um, or you get, or maybe, you know, she's taken 10 wounds, you roll a 10. She heals 10, you're like, fantastic. She's going to kill mm-hmm. whatever she's in combat with. So that's going to be my battle tactic. Um, so there's cool little tricks you can do. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and there's a lot of like, there's a lot of like reliable healing you can do. Um, and it's all about kind of not losing anything because everything will or should heal back to relatively full if you don't kill something uh, and so on and that's and that's really really cool but the two the 2d6 heal mix her playable without that yeah. she's really not like she's really um she really struggles 
And I love the swirling glow spikes as well that lets her retreat and shoot uh, or retreat and charge, which means that um, you can't get pinned into combat. One, if you make the charge, you get that living battering ram to potentially do mortal wounds. Yeah. You then get your monstrous rampage. You could do another D3 mortal wounds if you do the stomp. Yeah. Um, or you go, you know, the finest hour and then tap into the Titanic Jewel potentially. But then, you know, if you find yourself in an unfavorable combat or you just want to sling yourself up to the board, you've got the ability to retreat and then get into the backfield or get into something tastier um, and not have to sacrifice, you know, the retreat because you can shoot and charge, which, one, I love in Living Cities, but two, in Sylvaneth works so well. It really does, yeah. And I think the um, one, of the, one of the awesome things with... Um, with Alariel is that you can you can like if you if you get a decent thing you can do like you say you can do living batting ram arcane bolt and then stomp so you're getting three to three more balls realistically and it's it's a lot it can do a lot um and you can and she she wounds on twos anyway on her main attack so a lot of the time you save the best day ever or um finest uh, hour that oh, that's the one finest, finest hour, hour. Yeah, sorry, yeah yeah sorry i'm so used to calling it best day ever so uh but, Everyone um, calls it that. <laughs> just don't know. Yeah, just um, and then uh, you normally just use it for a plus one save. Just like uh, okay, she's going to get charged. Plus one save. That's fine. Um, but she she has a really fun ability as well. It, it's my favorite ability in all of AOS. It's really awful and it, it never goes off, but it does sometimes, and it is the best feeling ever. So it's the Talon um, Talon of the Dwindling uh is the best it's my favorite so it's if you do it so it's four attacks uh threes and fours no rend but if they fail a save with that well, however many they fail you roll a dice and on a six they die it is horrific odds of happening but i've done it to i did it to kragnos <laughs> uh <on> a, <laughs> does Durthu have that as well i feel like someone else has done that to me once uh liam so might have they, done it to so me once the tree lords used, so they so the tree lords and lariel used to have an insta kill ability but it used to be if they suffered a wound you rolled so for the you used to roll a d6 i think it was a d6 for the tree lords and if you rolled above their wound you insta killed them and lariel mm. was 2d6 and if you rolled above their wound you insta killed them uh but now it's just one dice on a six you die on a one to five the wounds negated and does nothing um but yeah i charged kragnos with an ariel um got two hits in uh, two wounds in sorry and he rolled a, he rolled a one and a four and i rolled the dice and i got a six so kragnos went in the talon um at face hammer uh, it didn't really affect the result of the game because that was all it was, uh, but and then in face hammer i did it to a vampire lord on zombie dragon who was um he had finest hour and mystic shield on him so he was on a two-up save. He rolled that six. And I got that six, and he was gone. <laughs> yeah, that's so good. That's so good because you are in this hero-heavy hero kind of meta. Obviously, that won't help you with Mega Gargans because you can't auto-slay Mega Gargans. But, you know, a lot of people are buffing up their heroes to be two-up armor save, you know, Amulet of Destiny to get that five-up ward. They're throwing save stack to kind of like to high heavens. Which kind of like leads me to an interesting question that uh, no, not that person. It was Spencer that asked me. Um, you know, how are you finding like Zinch Archaeon? Um, are you finding you know with the magical supremacy you don't have a lot of spells to be able to handle? Uh, Spencer is called in the the big A. Um, I assume big A means the big Anthony, not big Archaeon. But yeah, because <laughs> because he is one of the big bads right now. You know, Archaeon is one of the big bads in the meta. Yeah. How are so, you finding it? You know, with your lists. So, um, so I played, uh, uh, I've played uh, uh, Zeech Archeon three times now. So I played against Fabian, um, who is the guy who won uh, Mancunian Carnage, where I came fifth. Uh, and he beat me uh, reliably. Um, but I nearly caught him out first turn. Um, so the trick against Archeon uh, is to kill everything else. In, in, in for, with what I have in my list, if you have multiple dirties, you might be able to get through him, provided he doesn't have um, uh, reroll saves. So, uh, for example, I could stop. You need to. So they have a spell called uh, Shield of Fate, which lets them reroll all saves based on how many um, Destiny dice they have, and normally they have plenty. So mm. it's quite hard to deal with that. Um, I think Zijakion was oppressive as hell. Uh, however, it has got so not Archeon not having reroll sixes to hit anymore. 
it hurts them and yeah. the cogs change uh, massively hurts them uh, because what they do is they put their whole army there they'd have a blue scribes and then the whole army's rerolling cast and they're getting like 19 summoning points and then they're getting 20 blue horrors straight away and you're like this mm. is horrific um, but because they don't have that anymore, or that that much reliability, is that even if you don't get ma magic off, you should be killing. So in my list, if I've got six bows and an Ariel, so realistic odds wise, I should kill blue scribes and whatever they've put the general. So a lot of the time they do um, like a magister on disc or whatever, um, and you should be able to because you have global threat with your woods. You should be able to get so if you put six bows into the magister and alariel into um into the blue scribes if you can shoot the blue scribes off they lose all their rerolls and they become much less of a good casting because they don't have that many buffs and if you can shoot the general because there's each archeon build you run host arcana which is the uh once per game you get the free uh six screamers if you can shoot him off so i i play what if so if you play a one drop list and you out drop them because they're three drops i think if you can outdrop them and shoot off their general and a couple of their small heroes, suddenly Arche Archeon is still terrifying, obviously, but they don't have that much to do against anything else. And that gives you, it's still a really, really hard game. Like I, I say that as if like, you know, you do that, you win the game easy. <laughs> but <laughs> but if you- But, if but, you, you, but to your that, point, that, like if- yeah. If you go, if you if you put all of your resources into into the big bad, you know you will often find that you've committed too much and you don't get the result that you want. But you know, Matt, you are nailing it on the head. You know, play to your strengths, play to the movement, take down the support pieces, and at the end of the day, that's like literally half an army or almost half an army that can really only be scoring like what one two objectives at most. So you know you you know you're claiming the the, the battlefield while they've got one model and you might yeah. sacrifice some things and things to the wolves just to tie him up, use your board presence to like block his big base up. So he can't get into where he wants to be, but I, I couldn't agree with you more. Like don't get sucked into the game. Yeah. Yeah. You don't necessarily need to deal with him early on. It's hard. It, the, the hardest part with Archeon is the fact that if you're playing L'Oreal, he's, he has a field day because, um, because he can literally kill her without rolling a dice. Um, that's what that, that that's the worst part is they can go okay I'm gonna move uh, I'm gonna because they pregame moves so they pregame move six they move twelve and then they auto charge twelve and then they used to kill an Ariel and you're like this is fantastic uh, <laughs> and I haven't rolled a dice and Ariel's there you're like okay but but if you know that's what's gonna happen there are things you can do to play around it, it it's still a really difficult matchup every like I beat it um I played against it at Liverpool. A tournament in Liverpool, and I beat it then. Um, but it was a really hard game. Um, and the, the way I was able to beat it was the fact that I forced him to use his sixes to save Kairos um, by targeting him because all of his heroes were, in, were hidden. So mm. by targeting Kairos, and I was able to, to put him in enough threat that he needed to use his... He didn't have any fives, he only had sixes. So he couldn't afford to take the six damage on Alariel's spear, so he has to use one of the sixes. So then when Alariel did get into combat, uh, sorry, when Archeon did get into combat with Alariel, he couldn't he just didn't have the... Yeah. And then he has to roll for it. And then suddenly, if people are actually rolling dice, you have a game. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. I, I have not had Slayer of Kings go off on a dice roll. Uh, it's always been, you know, with the Zinch dice. The cheaty dice, as um, my, my Zinch guest talked about earlier. Two burning questions, and I want to bring up your list in a second. Um, one is the Underworld's Warbands. Now, um, are there any play? I think one of them gives you, like, re-rolling ones, or there's some some good shenanigans in, I think it's the Kernothi one. Do you have any thoughts around the Underworld's Warband in, in Sylvaneth? Yeah, so there's two. There's two in Sylvaneth. So you've got uh, Ulfari um, and his guys, and they're... They're like tree, they're, they're mini tree revens. They're a unit of three. That's the old one, right? Yeah. That's like all the yeah. tree revs and things. Yeah. And then you had the other one, which has like the then, centaur yeah. thing. And... and yeah, so uh, so so uh, Skeath's Wild Hunt. That's what it's called. Um, and they're kind of good. So so their spell is plus one to wound for a unit in melee. If it was just plus one to wound, it would be in my list uh, <laughs> on on uh, Bow Hunters. Um, 
But plus one to wound is really good, depending on what you're running, obviously. So if you are doing six sides, then plus one to wound is is really good. The only downside is it's on a seven, so um, it's a bit unreliable. Uh, but they are good. They can run and shoot as well. I think they can run a charge as – I think they can do both, um, which is good. It offers a bit of utility. It's a, a unit that you can throw forward onto an objective, take it, not worry about them for the rest of the game. Um you can do them on so Dirthu is really good on, um, Dreitcher potentially. Um, so there's there's a few options on who you want to put it on. The reason I don't use it uh, is because of Lariel wounds on twos. So I don't need it. Uh, and she's my big threat. Um so but I could definitely I could definitely see play in it for sure. If if you're running something, if you're running something that you want to alpha or you want to commit forward, like when you get those buffs off, then for sure. Yeah. Not so much Elthari. Elthari doesn't really... No, Elthari yeah, no. I was... thing, but, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I remember some early play with the first Underworld's Warband, and it was a bit of hit and miss. Um, but it's the second one, which is the, the more Kurnothi side, that I've seen some interesting lists kind of being built, but I haven't quite seen them rise to the tournament meta. Um, yeah. The other burning question, then I'll get to your list, is... You, you talked earlier about Dreadwood being uh, used to be a really good um, Grove. Has there been any change in the standing in Groves? Do you think, um, do you think, uh, you know, is Winterleaf back at all? I loved Heartwood. Heartwood was the one that I was building around. Are the Groves kind of shifted or is what used to be good in 2E still good in 3E? Yeah. So um, so the two lists, the two um, groves that were good in 2E or that would see the most play were Dreadwood was the most competitive um, in terms of singles events. And then Heartwood was the spam bow hunter build. Or was the, was the you know, you take 20, 24 bow hunters and you saw that a lot in teams. You didn't see it as much in singles. It did. Um, I know uh, Chris did very well at London GT with it um, in the singles, but generally you saw it at teams. Um uh, so those were the two kind of main ones. You saw some people do okay with Winterleaf and Gnarl Root thereabouts, but um, but w Gnarl Root gives you reroll ones to hit if you're within 12 of Wizard, and obviously in two, rerolls are everywhere. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, all out attack, uh, not all out attack, um, it's it's a weird, it's weird thinking about two. It feels like years ago. It's it? it's, <laughs> it's it's super it's super weird. And I, I I can remember one. Like I remember when Sylvaneth and you'd have like the the Frost Phoenix build with yeah. Winterleaf, and yeah. I've I've seen all the crazy builds. But yeah. what I'm hearing is that um what's what used to be good is still good, and there's a little bit of play in some of the other yeah. ones. So they don't yeah. don't throw them in the trash. Don't throw them in the trash. But I think I think Dread the Dreadwoods kind of uh, fall falls apart a bit because. Dreadwood's ability is that you get um, reroll ones to hit for spite reference. And you don't see spite reference that much because they don't have any rend. So they kind of don't do anything, unfortunately. Um, and you're obviously, like you said earlier, you used to take them in the Outcast's Battalion because it was so cheap. And now they don't do that anymore. So you kind of don't really use them that much. You do sometimes uh, if you need cheap battle line. Um, but because of that, that's the main ability. And then the only good thing about it the the artifacts um pretty bad it, it, it's minus one to wounded melee which is fine but it's not game winning uh and the command trait is you reroll battle shock tests if you're within six inches so you're like it's not really worth and you're forced to take them as well it's not like a lot of the new books where you can choose to take other i was i was literally about to say yeah. that like i've been reviewing the stormcast book as an example and it doesn't lock you into command traits and yeah. um and artifacts so it'd be curious to see like with sylvaneth what what would look like and you know if you remove the tax of you some know. of those artifacts and it doesn't force you into like warlord just to get the extra artifact what that would do and does uh, yeah. the grove go up or go down um Interesting, interesting comment. Do you have to be a model to be a Sylvaneth player? You are a handsome man. And everything I've spoken to, like Laurie's a handsome fella. You've got, like, I think Sylvaneth players are generally handsome fellas. So uh, I'm sure there's a, a lot of uh, attractive women there as well who play Sylvaneth, but maybe you do need to be a model to be a Sylvaneth player. Last question I have for you, because I've, I've, I've kind of lied to you, is both Hannah and Spencer were talking a little bit about thoughts around Tree Lords, Tree Lord Ancients, and Durthus. Do you have a high-level overview of, while I bring up the list, your thoughts on Tree Lords, Tree Lord Ancients, and Durthu? Yeah, so I think I think Tree Lord Ancients are, are cool. 
Um, so two Iron Agents, their command ability is plus one save wholly within 12, uh, which is really, really good. Um, and obviously, Kurnoth Kur Hunters have an ability that they always count in range of command abilities, and they extend it by 12. So realistically, if you're building around it, your whole army gets plus one save for command point in the in the hero phase, uh, which is really good. Um, and then they also get a free woods. Um, the problem is with Tree I always, I always run a Tree Ancient in, in second edition. The problem I've found with Tree Lords is that once they do their little, they do their plus one save, they do their, um, they do their free tree summon, and then they kind of T pose for the rest of the game. They kind of just exist to die because they don't do any damage, <laughs> unless like reliably anyway. You can, you can, because they do D6 damage, but it's three attacks, threes and threes. So the amount of times you are they monster? Are they a monster? They are monsters, yeah. So you give yeah. away a command point when it dies as well, or victory point, yeah. sorry, when that it dies as well. So they do they, like those things because obviously they have the four up fight last as well, same as same as all the three lords. There's 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 definitely cool stuff you can do with them. Uh, the the problem is is that like if you're playing against um like it's, like so for example if you're playing against twenty five bow snakes they just go okay we're gonna delete him and you're like okay or thirty sentinels and they go okay we're gonna delete him <laughs> and you're like wow this is this is rough <laughs> so um uh, so, so my my mindset is always kind of like what can i play against the big stuff like the, the, that is dominating the meta where i'm from anyway um however there is definitely play with with like dirthus for example if you can keep them reliably on a two-up save and um, with a new command ability that lets them fight top racket uh from uh, the realm of gear yeah. That makes them super more reliable. So, um, so there's there, there is definitely play you can do with them. Um, I don't I don't like tree lords, just basic tree lords, to be honest, um, because they give away VP. Um, I just I don't I don't I don't I get really stressed whenever I have anything that can give away VP easily. Um, but uh, but they can. I'm sure you could run them in um, in Winterleaf with a new command ability. I'm sure. I'm sure there's some fun you could have with that, because uh, then your command ability is every six to hit, and with a shooting attack, there's a mortal wound in addition. Um, and th they are, they have quite a few shots. Same with Dirthu, um, if you wanted to do something like that. So I think there's quite cool like things like that um, you could do with them for sure. So I brought up Matthew's list, and before somebody actually is me, um, yes, the Knight in Cantor went up. No, so it went down. Yes, cool. the Aether Wings went up, but collectively between the two it means that uh matthew's list is uh, exactly 2k so aether wings went up 15 it's up 20 nine in yeah. canter went down five so this is a 2000 point list um so five points but um for anyone who can't see the list it is a null route and this is one of the many examples that um obviously you can build and i want to kind of learn a bit more about why he's why you've gone down this route so you've got a lariel you've got your warsong revenant that's the general you've got nurtured by magic the chalice of nectar and flaming weapon which is one of the universal spells you got yourself ghost mist for the night in cantor interesting choice i'm sure you'll tell me more in a minute why you've gone ghost mist on the night in cantor you've got two units of tree revs one unit of spite revs a unit of six kernoth hunters with the great bows um, that one surprised me. I thought, oh, surely unit of six is going to be the with the um, the size, but you know we've already talked about why maybe that's not as viable. Um, you got yourself three Aether Wings, which I think was an interesting choice, even if they've gone up to sixty five points. I want to hear Matt why you think that's still valuable. Um, and then you've got yourself Chronomatic Cogs, and um, and you've gone Umbral Spell Portal. So exactly two K. And it's all in a battle regiment, so it's one drop. It's all one um, drop. That's tasty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we'll go through it kind of uh, systematically. Um, so obviously, Alariel kind of pins the list together. Um, so the list effectively is built around her. Um, so she's the one model that you send flying around, doing her thing. The rest of army kind of sits back, doesn't really move, sits in cover, has a good time kind of um just just exists um so warsong revenant as we talked about um has his um uh bomb kind of uh thing that he can do but he gets plus he can get plus two to cast uh cogs is in the list so that i can give him i can make him a three cast wizard 
because obviously he cast in my list the artifact chalice of nectar means he casts on 3d6 remove the lowest so if i give him an extra spell an extra cast sorry he casts that one th with the same bonuses um, so you th you still think chromatic cogs is valuable even though because it used to give you what plus one plus one spell for everyone within six inches of it yeah. um you think now despite that it changed to just one model within six um uh, it's still a valuable inclusion in the the army uh yeah i think so because because it's only 45 points and because it um the the thing is is it, like the va the value i get out of having a an extra cast on someone who's casting on plus two sorry plus three with 3d6 3d6 is is massive and it means that he can if i get that off it means that he can do his full combo so he can do throne of vines spell a portal and um and the bomb whereas if i don't get cogs off or if i don't have cogs then somebody else has to cast spell portal with no bonuses and then if that's unbound then what do i do basically um so that's why i like having it in there it gives me that like it gives me a few options so i go okay cogs got unbound that's fine okay now i'll try spell pool um and that's why i have three wizards or have to have three and wizards, the have the bomb you're talking about is unleash swarm of spites or is it a different yeah. spell no yeah, unleash cool. swarm of spites yeah his watch spell yeah um so uh his his command trait's good as well so so the start of the hero phase alariel heals d3 to everything within 30 inches Alariel obviously heals herself 2d6. Um, and then the uh, command trait, Nurtured by Magic, is if he casts a spell, uh, he can pick a unit within 18 and heal it d3. So if you get Warsong down to one wound with his four at board, uh, he's going to heal 2d3, basically, because you won't unbind all of his spells. Um, so he's going to heal 2d3. Uh, and then maybe I do the heroic recovery and get him back to full. Or maybe there's a spell called Regrowth, um, which heals D6 to a Sylvaneth unit. Um, so there, there's quite a few options. So this, so this list tends to, if you don't kill something, it tends to come back to full, like a lot of the time. Um, so yeah, so that's why I have all that in. Uh, the Knight Encanto, as we discussed, um, he's in there because having an auto unbind is fantastic. Um, and he's there for one job, uh <laughs> his contingency for for spell casting and then to all have an auto unbind to shut down any kind of key you know any, any stray ridiculous casts i can go no thank you um too so it might also be worth calling out just to rewind very quickly um because yeah. i always forget this particular rule is that the war song revenant knows the entire spell law from the law of the deep Alariel has it, so you're like, yeah, cool, it makes sense, right? God model has the whole spell law. But, you know, having a 3D6 cast and having access to the entire spell law from Law of the Deepwood, which is one of the reasons why I was looking at the Warsong in a Living Cities list, like, well, I get to bring that with me um, where, where I normally can't, which can be quite powerful. Um, but I love that flexibility between the two to, to whatever the situation might be, pull out the spell that you need. Yeah. No, um, yeah, having having have both of them having access to the whole law is really really good. Um, so there's there's a few spells in there that are like the main ones you want to be casting. So Throne of Vines obviously is the plus two to cast one. Regrowth is heal D six to a Sylvan Eth unit, um, and um, Virtuous Harmony is you can bring uh, D three models back to a Sylvan Eth unit or one to a Colonel Hunter unit. Um, so bringing back a Kern off the turn, uh, theoretically, is quite nice. It's quite a nice option. Um, another one that comes up more often than I thought it would is Deadly Harvest, um, which is every unit within three inches takes D3 mortal wounds. And sometimes when you're trying to get that multi-charge off with the Lariel to do mortals on the charge with, with Living Battering Ram, sometimes that happens to be, especially into things like Marathi, when they've both charged you, because that has happened. Um, and the other one is Tree Song, which is really. I was going to call that Tree Song. Yeah. I was going to say that's a quite, well, it's quite a good one because yeah. you pick an enemy unit within 16. Uh, it has to be within six of a Wildwood, though, but you get yeah. the reroll hits and wounds of one. So, you know, if you throw down Finest Hour, you throw down, you know, something that might trigger mortals or something, you know, delicious like we were talking about with the Talons. Um, like rerolling once to wound is so good. 
Yeah, it is. It is. So, um, Alariel's command ability is also real ones to wound. Uh, unfortunately, it's only in melee tree song as well. I should say, uh, it doesn't count for shooting, so you can't do it and shoot them with bows, sadly. Um, and the same with Alariel's command ability. Start of the combat phase, real ones to wound um, for everything within fourteen. But remember, Kurnoth's always count as being in range of that. Um, but what's sometimes quite nice is if you do if so, Alariel summons once per game, as we talked about. So sometimes if you summon three swords, put them into combat, Alariel can do her command ability for real ones to wound or tree song, and then have and then do all out attack on them because they haven't issued or received a command point. And then suddenly the swords are on uh, twos re-rolling ones, threes re-rolling ones, um, which makes them, which makes them on, really Models on sixes? Models on sixes to wound, in addition. Minus one, two damage. And into something like Pink Horrors or into Plague Bearers, that, sh that does, it does a lot. It does a lot more than you think it will um, into anything with a high save or skinks or anything like that. Um, so they're really good. Um, and then is there any other ones that are interesting? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the other thing as well is that if you get real ones to wound with Alariel or with with um, with Tree Song, you don't have to spend a command point to do it then, and then you can do all out attack. And then if you get that off, that means Alariel is going to be twos re-rolling ones, twos re-rolling ones. So you're pretty reliable then, um, which is nice because she only has four attacks <laughs> that do any damage. Two follow-up questions on Alariel. First one from yeah. the chat from Jonathan is, do you think Sylvaneth needs Alariel? Because the list that he's seeing, and I would tend to agree, um, a lot of them have Alariel. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of it depends on what kind of um game player you want to be like if if you want to be going four one five oh like without without luck well okay there's always luck but without like getting lucky with matchups with like beating the list that should be going four one um then you do need her i think anyway um if you if that's not something that really interests you and you and you want to win two or three games uh, at a tournament i don't think you do um, I think I think you need her to push into the top end of Sylvaneth. However, I don't think that that Sylvaneth are bad enough that she without her they fall apart. Um, I think you can definitely get a three-two with her without her. Sorry. Um, so so getting three wins at a two day. That, that's how I judge things is by how competitive lists are. Um, and I think you could definitely get three wins, um, which which is like a super good result. Um, so it's not all about like how can I get to how can I win five games. <laughs> it's more about how you want to play. Um, and uh, uh, the other the other thing to, like that I, I I never really mentioned, but it's what I'm more known for is that um, I play very defensively and I play very differently to how a lot of people play Warhammer. Um, I, I've, I kind of play my own game, and if you have a game that you play, if you play, if you like, if you, if you find that going offensive means that you play better and that you you open up armies and then you see people panic and make mistakes and then you capitalize on them. If that's how you play the game, then then you should build a list to capitalize on how you do that. So my list, the way I play is I rely on holding back, waiting for people to make mistakes, waiting for people to isolate things that I can capitalize on. And that's how I play the game because I'm quite a um, sit back, see what happens then react person i'm quite i'm quite, yeah. a, a, quite a reactive person as opposed to as opposed to a proactive person who a good example of a proactive person is someone like laurie so laurie's yeah. play style has always been he likes to do something see what happens and then react that and then like and then see how his opponent reacts and then react to that whereas i'm much more of a okay what's he going to do then how am i going to react to it so I think it's important to build depending on how you play as opposed to how I play, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's great insight because I'm probably like you. I, I like to play counterplay. I like to. I don't like taking first. Um, I don't like having like turn one, I'm going to do these four things, partially why I don't go the bridge combination. I hate taking bridge because that's not my play style. Um, the other burning question I had around Alariel was, is there any things in particular that you're summoning maybe more than others? Yes, there's flexibility. Yes. You know, you'll adapt to different scenarios and different opponents, but yeah. are there things that maybe are more likely to hit the table than others? Um, so nine times out of ten, I summoned hunters. <laughs> um, there's there's a few reasons I do. 
I I've ne I never summon the, the uh, so the only two things I, I threaten to summon are Colonel Hunters and Dryads. Um, so sometimes you need Dryads just to sometimes you don't quite have enough models somewhere. Then you go, okay, I've got to sacrifice something to put Dryads on. Um, how, but nine genuinely nine times out of ten, I just put Hunters down because they count as six on a, three Hunters count as six on an objective. They're tankier than Dryads. Um, they're going to last longer and they do more. So I tend to only summon them. I don't summon Tree Lords because um, I don't like summoning something that's going to give my opponent another point. Um, just my personal uh, thing. I think I think you could. I think there is definitely some play where if you needed, to, if you like desperately needed to to kill something like to win the game, and you you had an all out um, like go edict. I think maybe summoning a lot, summoning a Tree Lord, getting them to charge in, and then playing for the four up fight last. That could be something you could do. Um, I was I gonna say, I was gonna say with the tree lord, you've got the monster keyword. So if you find yourself in a situation where you can do two or more battle tactics to score you the extra VP, then it might be a worthwhile trade. But if you're only summoning it to get one battle tactic, then you give it away when it dies. So you're at neutral, where you're probably better off to what you've just said: dryads, Kurnoth hunters, something yeah. that's not a monster keyword. Yeah, exactly. And and there's a lot of, you, you kind of have to think a bit ahead with battle tactics a lot because there's things like sometimes, so in two, I had to, I had to drill myself out of this because in two, I would, if I saw an open objective, I would teleport five tree evidence on it and I would take it and I'd be like, that's mine. Woohoo, I got points. But if that scores you one point and there is a monster that they have nearby, you have to remember that you are also going to concede three points. So it has to be the worth the trade. You can't just, it, it's really, it's really, you have to think like a head ahead because you can't go, oh, I'm going to score a point because then they'll go, okay, I couldn't do a battle tactic because I was struggling. Now I'll just do broken ranks uh, with a monster. And suddenly they've got three VP and you're like, oh, well, I really shouldn't have done that. Um, but that is why I have Aether Wings in my list because <laughs> they can go wherever they want because um, they move 12. Uh, and obviously I can author on them six. Um, so they have an 18 inch move, um, so I can push them forward and they don't, they don't have to do anything, but if they, if they, but if I can move them onto a, especially on the ones that are like score one, score two, score more, if I can move them onto the middle objective, it means that none of my army has to commit to anything. It can all just chill out, um, and stay at the back. And then those aether wings will do my, will score the objective. They'll probably die. Um, but that's fine. <laughs> They've done their one job that they needed to do, and then something's had to commit to kill them. Um, so that's why I like having those in because they because they're not battle line. Um, yeah, I was going to call yeah. that unlike your unlike your tree revs and your spite revs, which are your battle line. And I think that's a, a lesson that people are quickly learning using those minimum unit size to be your battle line screen is a dangerous game with broken ranks out there in the field. No, exactly. Um, it is. It is, and it's kind of, kind of trying to find a fine line between that um, is a bit difficult because, like, so so I ran so at at um, so my list before this one before the points changes uh, was um, I uh, the only difference was that I had um, instead of five spite revenants I just had another five tree revenants, um, but obviously I had to drop one of those down to five spite revenants to save me the ten points which I could then put in. Um, to be uh, to 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 keep the aether wings, um, but there's like the argument is is that you know I could have instead of three aether wings I could have five spite revenants, um, you know, and why not? But it's well, actually I couldn't. But but like you you could, and then it, it's like okay, I get what actually, you're trying to say. Yeah, it, the the problem is is they fall into the same trap. Like I don't want I don't want that to happen. I want to have a unit that I can throw forward. I can screen with. That I'm not worried about, that I can throw them forward. Okay, that's taken objective. Cool. Like, no worries. That's 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 me scoring points and keeping in the game with, with no like repercussions. Yeah. yeah. No, I like that's it. Thing. I like it. I, th I think it's I think it's a good choice because when I reached out to you, it was the pre Stormcast battle time. So you know, Aether wins were 45 points, and I was wondering if you'd actually drop the Aether wins at 65, but it's very clear that the, it's still valuable because one, it's got the speed to 
um, you know, you can score without having to trade much away. And kill points don't really mean a lot right now. So unless, you know, tournaments kind of do start doing comps, like kill points, who cares? Yeah, exactly. Um, and to be honest, this isn't the kind of list I take to a kill point tournament um, because it doesn't need, it, it does kill stuff, but like uh, some armies, it really doesn't kill. So if this played against like 60 more tech or um, I'm trying to think of other horde lists, like 40 um, pink horrors, like it would really struggle because uh, <laughs> this is all about elite damage, which is where the meta is going at the moment, which is big elite armies. Um, and this is about elite damage, not horde spamming, horde killing, but horde isn't really the meta at the moment. Um, so that's kind of um, where we're things. So. Yeah. And as Nordo's pointed out as well, like Aether Wings can be a great recipient to kind of handle all that. Uh, sorry, unleash hell. So yes. if you happen to find yourself like, you know, trying to charge yeah. into, you know, again, some shooty, shooty unit, um, yeah. great sacrifice to accept that unleash hell. If they don't play it, then you've got something to charge in. So exactly. um, happy days. I did um, in in uh, in that game in Facehammer where I played against the 25 Bro Snakes, get a unit of 15, which I charged my Aether Wings in and then charged the Larry Allen. And that meant that it just gave me the fantastic cover I needed to make sure Laria went in on full health um, and then just just mopped up, really. Um, so it's really good. Uh, yeah, so the rest of my list, so Tree Everance, obviously, as we've discussed, they have their little teleport. So they can tell about anywhere on the board instead of moving. Um, they also have a really cool ability called Martial Memories, which means they can reroll one dice per phase. Or if it's a charge roll, they can reroll the whole roll. Um, so it means you're you when you teleport them if you need them to get if you need them to make a charge they they have a reroll naturally so they're always rerolling a charge um it means they can reroll a run roll reroll battle shock it, it's quite a nice little um reliable little reroll that you get um they also have a, they also have a six inch pylon it's not a good six inch pylon but it is a six inch pylon uh, it does help sometimes um but the, and then they're okay in combat. They're not fantastic, but they're they're, they're fine. They, they do their job of like existing. Um, and then obviously the big one, the controversial one that everybody is like, why is the six bow hunters? Um, and the reason I have them uh, is is like like I've said, I, I like I like to be able to put six bows in a in a woods on an objective and go. That is effectively a three up save, ignoring rend one without any interaction from me if i get all the defense where we're ignoring rend two the mystic shield we're ignoring rend three um you have to kill some to take an objective off because they count as 12 um so you're unlikely to take it off me otherwise um they offer me so they fact they have a 35 inch threat range but obviously with the teleport it becomes global um mm -hmm. all out attack on them uh this isn't really a command point heavy army so all out attack on them becomes fantastic Make some threes, rerolling ones, threes. Um, just you'll do a lot of damage into. You'll do a lot more than people think you will. You'll shoot mm -hmm. something and you'll be like, like you might play against thirty marauders and you'll kill twelve of them, and you're like, oh, that's not a very good point investment for four hundred fifty points. And you're like, okay, but this is the first turn, so you're like, you know, like this is the first turn, and also it's you know you haven't lost anything. It's not like sentinels where they shoot something off and then if anything goes into them, they die. Right, these are, these are tanky uh, hunters, and they do they do mortal wounds at the end of the combat phase based off how many models are left in the unit. Um, so you can you can really like um, you can chisel people down, and you can really catch people out with how tanky they are. Um, and then when you remember that rallies in the game, um... <laughs> it's literally what was coming out of my mouth. Literally, like the minute you you stop for a second, I was going to mention like it's a great recipient for rally as well because yeah. you know if you if the the unit get kind of whittles down to one or two left, you throw down a cheeky rally and you get one or two sixes. That's five wounds of pop coming back. Exactly, it is, it's a really really big. And then if you get there's a spell, obviously Virgis Harmony, you can bring another one back. Um, so if you get a bit lucky, if you spike, you only have to spike once, and suddenly you're in like a, oh, hang on. <laughs> All the Kurnoths have come back. Oh, no. Um, because they are put, they are tough to pull down. They are, no. And the other thing as well is that if you're committing to them, then that's more then, then that means that Warsong's still stacking his spell. It means Alariel is still going around your backline wreaking havoc. 
you have you have to commit to something but you want to commit to everything is the whole point of the list so it forces your opponent to go okay i'm going to kill that thing and while i'm while they're killing that thing if they don't kill that thing then they're in big trouble because everything else will continuously do their thing and also the thing they've they fought won't so it's it's good that's kind of how yeah, i because you got because you've got a Lario, the Warsong, and the Kurnoth Hunters who are solid threats in their in their own way. And if you ignore, if you go for them, then the tree revs are just teleporting around the board, you know, tapping objectives, getting in the behind the lines to get battle tactics. Um, so, that, yeah, there's a lot of good threats, but it's not quite always the hammer threat of just, you know, absolute combat yes. damage. You've got, you've got some real good utility and versatility that's probably helping you handle with what is right now a really weird meta as it kind of settles a little bit. Yeah, no, exactly. And a lot of the time as well, uh, like I said, so, so first turn, I might, um, I might have like three, five tree revenants, have them run in the corner. So that's my first turn. Second turn, I might have, I might have left a battle line unit on a bit low. So I'll do broken ranks, try and get it with a Lariel spear. To get the extra point you know third turn uh maybe do aggressive expansion take two ter- take two um objectives not in my territory it's quite easy and then you know turn four okay Lariel's still alive there we are monstrous takeover and then you know i haven't really done anything like i haven't had to commit anything to do a battle tactic in this turn four and then turn five my opponent goes oh what battle tactic are you going to do i'm not really sure there's many left and i go i'll just have two units in your territory mate and then just boop put my tree revs over there and it's done um so you can play the game for points without having to do anything that's what's so nice is that the list is designed so that you know you can just you can do so much points wise without having to do anything um so like for example if you played like the vice um you know people always say oh but how what do you do like if you play against go check on the vice you know he walks in the middle it's his objective but it's his objective on turn four up until that point as long as you're doing battle tactics your opponent's gonna struggle eventually because they can't do them reliably um whereas you can and all all it takes is one or two points difference and you mitigate all the objective points that you're going to lose later on and you can you can win games just just by just by mathing it out a lot of the time at the start um so that's kind of kind of what happens a lot of the time what I found, I, I played a Nighthorn game recently where obviously Nighthorn has no heroes. No hero, monsters, no monsters. They obviously have plenty of heroes. Um, but what I noticed was how hard achieving battle tactics became when they don't have monsters. And I think a part of the reason why I really like your list is you've only got one monster and there's no cheap battle tactics as an opponent because um, Alariel is just a tough nut to crack. Yeah. Exactly, because if you go, if you go, okay, so 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 realistically, Laria, like unless you're unbinding me, Laria will have Mystic Shield, um, and then you know if you go right, we're going to bring her down. I'm like, cool, best day ever, plus one safe. Cool, she's on plus two. She's on a two up, ignoring round one. Fantastic, um, you know, and maybe there's a mystical terrain somewhere, so she has a six up ward. There's a command point in Nile Root that gives her a six up ward safe, um, but it's only in the combat phase. So if you, it depends whether you have enough stacks to save by that point um to use it um so you know there's it, it is a really big commitment um to try and take her down killing the war songs a real pain as well because if you don't have something that can just shoot it off uh with like 10 wounds or more or sentinels um you can't kill him because getting to him is really awkward um and you can't shoot him because he'll be in the woods um so it's it becomes really difficult to go okay what am i gonna do and then things like broken ranks are fine um but like so so uh so gargans normally struggle against my list um so p- pause that for a second pa- pause yeah, pause because i I have, a, I have a question in the chat that i want to bring up in a second but okay. before that question cool. um ben asks um quote unquote um can you tell us about the proper portal use uh unbinding times etc okay yeah yeah so so uh, so portal is an interesting one so spell portal is something you have to micromanage uh, I sometimes forget, and it will cost you games if you forget. Um, so the spell portal is an interesting one because uh, the way it works is it's set up, both parts are set up within 18. So there's a cool little trick you can do where if you have, say, a Lariel further up the board and you have Warsong back here and the enemy is up here, right? If a Lariel is within 18 of the Warsong, she can cast spell portal and both parts have to be set up wholly within 18 of the caster. So you can put one part over by Warsong 
and you can put one part up here. And then even though the portals are like 36 away, that's fine. Because they're within 18 what? of the caster. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. So I that. need to check that rule. Like, what the hell? Yeah, unless it got F did it get F unless it got FAQ. I need to look. I need to look, need to look at that. Like, it was I, look, yeah. the, the the comment section in YouTube will tell me when we stop recording if that is being FAQ'd. Yeah. But that sounds like some some interesting yeah. list tech that if you are yeah. going to do that at tournament, I would maybe check it quickly. But it's yeah, I like yeah. It. I, I, I like some of that science. I've been I've been away, so I haven't I haven't, I haven't really read the, the well. I've read it. I read it up to thing, but I didn't do it at Face Hammer, but. Uh, but you can do it um, because before you could, YouTube Hammer, comments tell us, yeah, because before Face Hammer, um, you could do um, uh, both ends of the spell portal. Some people did that. Uh, so when you cast a spell, you could cast it through both ends of the spell portal, theoretically, because people did it with Teclis, which was horrific. Yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> not so bad. Warsong can could could do it, but it wasn't as threatening. Um, but um, but no, so so uh, but the the correct like dispelling thing for it is that um, at the end of uh, sorry at the start of your opponent's turn, you want to dispel it because if you don't if you if you, if it stays into your turn and they dispel it, you can't recast it in the same turn. So then you can't you have no threat. So so it's why it's sometimes um, taking. So it's it's actually kind of weird. I don't like double taking double turns anymore in in three very often. I quite like giving them away um, because one of the army's biggest weaknesses across the board for Sylvaneth is double turns. Mm. Uh, you lose a lot of... The, so double turns will cripple Sylvaneth, basically, because you don't have enough. You rely on getting your turn, healing up, taking a hit, getting your turn, healing up. Um, so one thing that's quite nice to do sometimes is if you get the... Because I'm a one drop. Um, so if you give away the turn and then they have a turn, then you have a turn, then you win priority... You give it away, and then you're never you're never at risk of a double turn. You're always playing, and then you're and then going into um, turn three priority. Um, you've got the you're going second, so you have the you're either getting a double turn or you're burning an objective. There's no downside, um, mm. so you're you're kind of not relying on priority rolls, and you're not you there's you're not going to get oh I'm winning the game, but I just got doubled, so I lost the game um there's a lot of like okay actually i'm going to manage this game and i'm going to go second let you do what you do cool i'm going to have my turn i haven't done that much but you you're still not in an offensive position so you can have another turn like there's a lot of like um because people never want to give away a double turn uh, that's why so that's the thing yeah, so kind of in a good, decent, yeah. Especially early on, like a lot of people, when they, if they do get the double from turn one to turn two, a lot of the time people want to take it because they love the idea of the double turn. But right now, you're right. Like there's so many incentives by by going second in turn two, like being able to burn an objective, obviously like the additional CPs that happen going second. Um, yeah, I think people are going to need to get more and more confident in giving away the priority because in most cases, all of my opponents, the winner they win priority it's just automatically I want it. Like, give it to me. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, and that's kind of... Uh, and, and I mean, so, I like, I think there's a lot of, uh, like, just being calm <laughs> and not yeah. getting excited. Being like, okay, so what, what am I going to do? Okay, think about this. No. Okay, I don't need it. I'm not going to do anything, so there's no point. Um, you know, sometimes you do need to. Sometimes Alaria might have survived on two health and you're like, okay, I need this turn. <laughs> but... Um, but like you know, yeah. Second last question before the other uh, the mega gargan question is: Do you have any thoughts and opinions in taking a Gotrek or a Kraken Eater in a Sylvaneth list? Now I've played against Sylvaneth with Gotrek. It was quite powerful. It was um you know did a lot of damage and probably the hammer that you needed if you didn't take a Lariel. It was like a War Song and um and Gotrek. But what are your thoughts on having the Ginger Ninja? So um I think. I think he can work. Um, I don't. I don't think you take the. Uh, I don't think you can take um, uh, the big gargant. I don't. I don't think you need to. I think. I think. I think you get the same out of things like Tree of Ancients. I think. I think they're like the same. I don't think you need them. I mean. I mean. Obviously, if you want to take one, who who is going to stop you? Um, but uh, but Gochak, I think definitely he definitely has play. I think he has play in all order because he's just fantastic. Um, 
but I think I think in Silver, I think he does offer you that offensive threat that you can put on an objective um, for sure. The, the hardest part for me is when I was building a list, I was like, well, what do I drop for him? Um, you know, do I get rid of six bows and put him in and that 10 dryads? It just it doesn't feel like a worthwhile trade for what I'm trying to do in my specific list. Um, but there's definitely play with him. Like, like um, Gojek is fantastic and he's really, really good. Um, I'm probably going to end up playing him this weekend. I'm playing at a tournament this weekend, so I'm probably going to end up playing him. Um, but um, but he, he he has some really um, he doesn't really have any tricks in Southern Earth. That's the only thing. Because obviously in Deep King, you can you can make him run in charge and things like that. You you don't have anything that can affect him. Um, but he can be that big 16 inch. This is my zone. <laughs> yeah, come get yep, me. Stay away. Want. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Which kind of leads me to the Mega Gargan question then is, you know, you're, you're seeing this rise of Megas who are just going to walk up onto an objective and just park themselves and just go, right, this objective's mine. And if there's multiple Megas, they're just like, you're not taking them. And you don't have the bodies. You do not have the bodies to handle a Mega Gargan army. What advice or what thoughts do you have on on, on such a list? So, so I love playing Gargans, <laughs> believe it or not. So I, this list does great into Gargans um, because you can, you, you don't need to engage them. So, and they can't, so Gar Gargans want to survive as long as they can. Um, mm. And you can isolate them and pick them off pretty easily with this build. Because what you can do is you can, you can, you can pick for, um, you know, I can summon three bows and then suddenly I've got nine bow hunters and a Lariel shooting uh, shooting one of them from 30, well, 24 for Lariel from miles away. Um, the Gargans can't really get to me until like turn three. Um, and, you know, it depends. It dep it's, it's always battle plan dependent. Some of the battle plans, the one that's new Border War, that one I really struggle with because obviously they just move on and they control the objectives. And what can you do? Um, but they don't, like, Lariel will get like a lot through onto them. So they can't really afford to fight her. So it's it's an interesting one that like they can't they can't commit to me and I don't want to commit to them. So it's kind of like a they have to stand off and do nothing and hope that I don't kill them, but I will kill them because I do and I have enough damage and I have enough threat range to get to them because Laria moves sixteen. So it's really hard for them to to stay sort of in that gap where they can't get hit. Um and um and gargans are great for controlling objectives obviously because they just walk on and they're like this is mine um mm. but that's fine but a lot of the battle plans require you to split up um so a lot of them require you to move around go to different places and then if there's one gargan on his own you can chip him and then send the lariel in finish him off and then move on um and one of the other good things as well is that um small gargans kind of let down gargant lists so four i haven't played against four yet so four will be an interesting dynamic um, four megas four megas yeah because yeah. that'll, that'll change the dynamic a bit but not too much i don't think but when you play against anyone with small gargans um they become very easy for me to kill so six bows will take one down. Five, really, like five up right. armor save. They have like they're, they're hot guard. I they, they're the damage dealers, but they are true glass cannon. Um, right. And it's interesting you talk about this because um, I always talk to people about sons running your megas as power pairs because unfortunately a mega gaga on its own does not do a lot of damage. No. Um, it's just not consistent enough outside of like a particular tribe. So you yeah. run them in power pairs, but if you are trying to split off across the, the battle plan and there is lots of objectives, then um, again, you've really got the objective struggle, game to yeah. play as opposed to, yeah. And like avoid the amulet of destiny, regardless yeah. if it's on a mega yeah, or the, uh, some, yeah. yeah. But the but the but the thing is as well is the reason Gargans are so kind of um, they, they they get they get such an early lead not so much from the objectives but from battle tactics because they go we're going to run three okay cool we've got the extra plus one for a monster cool we're gonna like anything they do they're like I got plus one cool awesome plus yeah. one cool awesome um, so you just have to try and mitigate that as best you can so my list when I play into Gargans if they have a small one br broken ranks bring it down nice and easy um is, is my attitude towards it so i can go okay first turn i'll just run these three units well chip off some wounds from that one chip off some wounds from that one okay how many have they got left okay he's got six left cool and ariel's gonna throw a spear cool she's killed him that's uh that's my battle tactic done with the monster 
Fantastic. Next one. Cool. We'll do that one. Done it with a monster. Fantastic. And if you don't do it with a monster, you've got the six bows to shoot them and then you just do it. So you have contingency and contingency to be able to just kill those. And then they'll get you the points mitigation that you're losing. So you'll be like, okay, I'm two points down. Oh, well, I've done my two battle tactics with a monster. So now I'm two points up. And now it's turn three. The Gargans still aren't fighting me and they're running out of battle tactics and I'm not. So I've still got monsters. I, I can still go, I've got monstrous takeover. I've got two in your territory. Um, you know, I can um, I can slay your warlord. I'm never going to slay their warlord because it's normally the one with the, the amulet. Um, but I've got two there that I can do without trying. But then the Gargans have got to go, oh, okay, what do we do? We've got to, we've got to kill a battle line unit. Where's their battle line unit? Oh, all three revenants are at the back of the board. Well, we can't kill them. Um, okay, what are we gonna do? Do we, you know, do we want to kill the warlord? He's in a tree 25 inches away, not gonna get him. Um, yeah, maybe we try and kill an Ariel, but she's on one side of the board. So, do we try it with one? And then, you know, if they're lucky and they kill her, then fair enough. But if they don't, which is more statistically probable, then suddenly they failed the battle tactic and they're two, well, effectively four points behind. And remember, also, every time one of them dies, I get an extra point. So it's all about trying to just mitigate those points differences um, so that you, at the end of the game, you won't get a big win differential between them, but at the end of the game, you, you, you're you like, okay, I've met them point for point. They've only got one left. So as long as I do my battle tactic and they don't, I win the game. So then you go, okay, okay, so as long as they don't kill an Ariel, and then you don't make the mistake of going, okay, I'll screen them with five true evidence then. And then give away like broken ranks. As long as you're constantly mm. thinking, okay, how can I math? It's a lot of math. It's a re it's really uh, unfortunately it's how you play into gargants in my experience. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a it's a degrading army. Though. It, it degrades yeah. really. I wouldn't say it degrades quickly, but you know, if you're defeating a mega gargant army, you've really got to stop them from scoring late game, and you've got to play the late game because early game. They're going to win, but come turn three, turn four, when they start dropping off from objectives and battle tactics, that's when you kind of, re, you know, you rally yourself. Uh, it kind of goes into the fact that your name is Math Math Mellow, being the maths coming in. <laughs> Last question, because I need to go to the bathroom, and this has been a great conversation that I would love to continue, you know, talking to you. And your Twitter handle is below if people want to chat and talk a bit more list tech with you. The last question we haven't really acknowledged yet, and this is to, to reward the people who have hung out this long, is Wildwoods. How do you think about your Wildwood placement? How do you consider, you know, you've already talked a little bit about, you know, hiding particular units and getting the pluses to cast, but what's your masterclass in Wildwoods? And then we'll kind of wrap it up. Yeah, okay. So so Wildwoods have changed a lot. Uh, so the attitudes of how you play them have changed a lot as well because we had one clump of three, then we had three individual ones that you could place down across the board. And now we're back to one, two, or three in a, in a clump or on their own. Um, so in my experience uh, at the moment is that you want to do three somewhere near your war, where you want your war song to be or where you want your kernels to be if there's um, a threat from shooting or magic because you want to be able to deny that line of sight. If there's not so much, um, then you want to think about, um, so it's, yeah, so, so the other thing as well is you want to be deploying it so that your Kurnoth hunters with bows can get within wholly within six, so that you have the option to go, if you do need another woods to get something to hit the backboard, you can, you have the option to summon one, teleport, go in. Um, so what I like to do is, if I can, in terms of summoning them during the game, is summon a woods onto an objective because they have to be three inches away, but you can still do that like a comfortable little tree like that around it or two. So I try and get that onto an, any other objective that isn't like in the middle or in, where their threat is. Um, because then if I do that, then um, it means that I can put my six bows in there in that new woods. And then they'll sit on that objective instead. And then suddenly there's 12 models on that objective. Um, mm. so that's kind of how I try and do it. So I did it against in that game again against Piotr. We were playing um Star Strike or the new Star Strike, and he deployed his army in one corner and the the but the um it dropped in the other corner because it came down to turn three. So I used spell portal to summon a wildwood on that objective, teleported six bows on there, and then suddenly he was never getting that objective. Um, because even Marathi does very little to bow hunters in combat. Uh, when they're in cover yeah. so so and she only counts as five so she's got to get through a lot of them 
Um, yeah. Especially when I, because she did get Mind Razor off, but obviously I had the author one bind so that I stopped it and then couldn't do it. So there's, there's a lot of cool little play you can do around stuff like that. Yeah. Which is, you know, like, which is really a reminder of, um, uh, sorry, so Spencer's asking, I don't understand how large models interact with Wildwoods. Do they climb them? Um, so are you uh, it's, it's really fun. So Wildwoods are fun. So um, it, it the same, it's the same with any terrain. Um, so they're not impassable. Um, however, so Gargans can just ignore them now. Um, so Gargans can just, the long shanks mean they can ignore them thanks to the FAQ. Um, but the way the way it works with things that don't fly, so for example, Kragnos, if the gap, if he can't fit through the gap of the woods, he has to go up and then down. And then you measure the distance of up and down, same as any other terrain, and then you go up yep. and down, and then you can be there. Terrain is really awkward at the moment in general because you can finish halfway down because yeah. of how because you can finish on the side of terrain now and you can do that in trees as well because they're not impassable um so it's a little bit awkward it the, the best bet is to like the, the, as it is with everything is to discuss with if you're at a tournament talk to the to um if, if you if you're playing against someone just ask them just be like how do we want to play this and just as long as you play it consistently it doesn't really matter um, you know, as long as you're not like going, oh no, you, you know, I, I'm going to move up and down and finish six inches above. So you can't charge me, but I can charge you as long as you're not playing like that. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It, it's all, it's, it's about using common sense more than anything else. Um, Intention is key. Yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right. Like you can, you can finish like half on the terrain, which makes it really weird. So, you know, um, yeah. exactly. especially if you don't have a flyer, that's, um, it, it, it's a bit you, awkward So Yeah. But it's not impossible. You're right. Like you, you yeah. just because there's a wobble there doesn't mean I got to go around. I can measure up if that works better for me. But um, any other advice you would have around the wildwoods? Um, I, it's just one of those things that you know um, it takes time to learn how to use them, and you know, not, let alone put them down for the first time, let alone any summoning. But yeah. um, any other advice on on wildwoods? Um, the the biggest advice is learn how to transport them properly because uh, i don't <laughs> <laughs> so somebody um somebody did raise that up they like uh uh where is it um the real question is from ben the real question is um where do you find parking at tournaments for that long haul strip container for all the wildwood models um yeah so i so i i do a little it, it's kind of it's kind of a, a sin to be honest but i don't put any leaves on my woods so I, they're just they're just like blank trees um and it, it's all narrative but of course but it means that i don't have to i don't drive so when i travel half the country on a train it means i don't have to lug four suitcases um yeah. which i would have to because i have i have 27 trees i have 27 individual wildwoods um so <laughs> so if i was gonna and i don't use them as much now but especially when i could summon three individual ones um yeah. i was using like i was i was running out so I was like, whoa, going to put three there, three there, three there. So There used um, to be a time where you drop like six different bases throughout the game. You just like summon, summon, yeah. summon. Like you just threw it with so many yeah. trees. But yeah, I think that it's been cut down a lot. But yeah, sure. yeah, with the leaves, it does make it quite large. It's sad because they look like the lovely yeah, exactly. yeah, piece of cool. terrain. Yeah. But but just from a transport perspective, they're a bit of a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. And another thing I've been asked actually in your Discord before, um, so I'll address it here as well, is that um, – some of the wordings on the wildwood stuff is a bit wonky so people say like because it's within six of the wildwood but it's never defined where the wildwood ends and starts so a lot of people some people say that if you you know with the leaves they technically because they extend out longer the range is bigger and you have to be to be three inches away and stuff like that and, and again like do like just play with intent so be like yeah. obviously i'm going to play to the base and then just don't yes. not play to the base, if that makes sense. If any and if anybody says, "Oh, I want you to play to the leaves," tell them to go away, and um, <laughs> and just like and yeah, just just no TO will ever be like. I can't imagine any TO no. would ever be like, you know, no, you have to do that because. So just yeah, just play as long as you play with intent and you keep consistent. Like nobody's ever gonna have a problem. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll be measuring and piling in from the weapon that's extending over the base, not necessarily the base. Like, yeah. 
Doesn't yeah. Work. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll go back to what like we, like 40k there used to be stories of people like snapping banners and snapping weapons off just to keep them out of like line of sight. Yeah. And that's, that's that's a world that I don't want people ripping off leaves and like exactly. you know extending leaves like really far out <laughs> just to like oh look my wine woods yeah. like the narrative is like it's fruitful and treeful and like yeah. there's more leaves than normal and you're like no you're just being yeah. gamey. Yeah, exactly. Because I, I had an instance of that once where um, it wasn't with Silverneth. I was playing I was playing a fun game with Lumineth. Um, and I've had one of my my, my wind, um, not wind mage, my, my stone mage has been um, commissioned. Uh, so it's very nicely done. But the base is custom and it's really tall. So it's like up on a spiral, up on a mountain. And it looks really cool. But the old Longshanks rule for Gargans was they could only pass over models that were four inches or smaller. And mine was mine was four point like three, so they couldn't mm. pass over my model because I'd made it big. And obviously, I didn't play it like that. I was like, of course, you can move over it, but like, I was like, technically, that's like <laughs> a modeling well, for advantage end. there. But like, I mean, rules is written, so so uh, so uh, don't play like that, basically. Like, <laughs> well, to end the to end the to end the conversation, yeah. I'll share one funny story with you, and that is an opponent uh, back in the first edition modeled a brick wall on his army, um, so he he tried to carry plus one armor save with him on cover the, uh, as he walked around, and quickly we said no that's rubbish that's that, that's not a thing you can't build a wall on the top of your base and say that you ignore line of sight and you get plus one no I like that. so don't don't do that don't be that yeah. person but <laughs> matthew this has been an awesome conversation i really need to pee um but yeah. if people want to talk to you you know you've already mentioned the discord but more importantly you are active on twitter your twitter handle is below any shout outs you want to make out to the peeps um obviously can you garrison in woods no no no, no. It's, it's not a garrisonable feature. No, no I didn't think so. But anyway, let's let. But you can't garrison. No. no. Any peeps and homies you want to shout out, and then we'll kind of go wrap this up. Uh, no. Um, the the only person I shout out is so I'm playing. You know, Luke Morton, who you did the, I think so. I'm playing him later. The, uh, so that'd be fun. Uh, <laughs> Um, so cool. Caused a bit of controversy on my channel by not having a Slaves to Darkness with, with, list without Archeon. How dare he not take the big bad Archeon? But um, yeah, sure. it was a good chat. It was a good chat to see what a list would look like, especially with Knights of the Empty Throne. But yeah, of course. dude, this was awesome. I really enjoyed it. I uh, not only did I enjoy it, I think it was an interesting uh, masterclass on battle tactics. Um, you know, you you listen to this, and I would I would even li listen to this again. Just listening to how you're thinking about battle tactics, you mentioned, you know, you've gone four and one in a lot of events so far, not just one off many, and you haven't really been dropping battle tactics. So, you know, really listening to the way you've crafted from the Aether Wings, not giving away broken ranks, to the way you've only got one monster in your list, where most people are trying to cram two or three monsters in their lists. The way you're thinking about, you know, taking advantage of the board. Um, there's been a lot of great insights in this video. So much appreciated for that one. Yeah, all good. Um, yeah, I, I, I'll always talk about Sylvanath. So if anyone wants to message me about Sylvanath, I, I never shut up. So <laughs> that's a good yeah it's good yeah, we, we need passionate people like you and i think we've already got some converters to people bringing on their um their kernoth hunters as bows and i think some people are now being re-inspired by some of the other builds that maybe hasn't seen play for a while um last question dry char i love dry char do you like dry char uh so i mean <laughs> i'm a, i'm a controversial person so i i don't really at all ever to be honest but she's she's cool. I love her. She she's great. She's the only Sylvanath model I don't own because uh, I don't like the model that much, uh, which is a really controversial. So I'm ruining the video now. Uh, but personally, I don't I don't like I don't like her and I don't like what she does. She's cool, but she like she doesn't offer anything that I don't already have from other things. Fair enough. Personally. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's, right, I'm I, that's, that's my that's my person. That's that's my controversy for the video. Um, Matthew, you're dead to me. Can't believe you we've ended this on a low note. If you like dry chart, let me know in the comment section. I want to see a whole <laughs> bunch of love heart dry chairs in my comment section. Please let me know how much you love dry chart. Um, I think people are already like, 
Oh, I thought people commented. No, no one's commented yet. Comment now, right now, at this very second. Matthew, this is an absolute pleasure. Good luck in your game against Luke. Good luck against your tournaments. And, um, you know, maybe we'll pick up this conversation again in a couple of months' time when the medal starts to settle or what happens with, you know, Stormcast and whatever comes out next or if we even change um, battle packs and what Sylvaneth kind of looks like, you know, in the near future. So um, you now have an open invitation to the channel. Fantastic. Cool. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here and happy to be back. So, <laughs> so thanks for the chat. Thank you all. Let's uh, talk again soon. I love Drycha. Thanks for sticking around until the end. I hope you found that video interesting and you walked away with a few new ideas. If you did, I would appreciate it if you hit like on the video as well as left me a comment. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section below. The conversation will continue over on Discord, so links down below in the episode description if you want to join the Discord and continue the Age of Sigmar conversation. I want to give a massive shout out as well to these absolute bloody legends, these champions who have continued to support me through Patreon or YouTube members. That is going directly into supporting the maintenance and the growth of this channel. So thank you very much, guys. Much appreciated. And until next time, roll more fixes.